You're listening to Convenience Matters, brought to you by Nax. Whether it's for food, fuel, drinks, or snacks, about half of the U.S. population shops at a convenience store every day. We'll talk about what we see at stores and what the future may hold for our industry. Welcome to Convenience Matters. My name is Jeff Leonard. I'm with Nax, and we are at the Nax Show, and we are seeing some amazing products here. Um, new innovations, new packaging, new exhibitors to the channel, and it really is exciting to see all the things here, but none of this works if you don't have the backbone of how things work at the store level and how it works with your employees, and that's going to be the focus of today's podcast. So joining me today, I have a co-host, Kevin Coop. He is the uh, content guy at Morning Newsbeat. It's a daily po- uh, daily newsletter that covers everything. I like blog. You know, blog. When, I, when I started writing Morning Newsbeat 17 years ago, I couldn't call it a blog because too many of my readers were so old that they would think to themselves, I don't read blogs. So they would never have read it. But now everybody reads blogs. So it's perfectly cool. Right? He's a blogger. I'm a blogger and, then pr- and, and proud of it. And also a podcaster yes. and also a speaker and all kinds of other things. And... Um, we're joined today by two, two uh, guests, Tanner Kraus, president of Come and Go. Welcome. Hello. Thank you. And also Mark Stanley, the founder of Y Company. And uh, we brought them here today because they led a session where they talked about uh, traction. And traction is not something that happens when it's snowing out or whether it's raining out. It, it's not related to your vehicle. It's related to your business. Mm-hmm. So, uh, Tanner, starting with you, can you just tell us about what your involvement is in in, in Come and Go, of course, has 400 and some stores in Iowa, uh, very large, very progressive, uh, very thoughtful company. Uh, why do you look at something like Traction in terms of how do you move forward as a business? Well, first off, Jeff, Kevin, thanks for having me. It's a pleasure to be here. And you know, Traction is the book that describes the EOS, or the Entrepreneurial Operating System, and that's a framework for running your business. And for come and go, you know, we have a long history of entrepreneurialism. And that dates back to my grandfather who started the company in 1959. And when my father took over as CEO in 1104, you know, we lacked a lot of process and we were more kind of a fly by the seat of your pants, let's do the deal that's, you know, kind of right there in front of us. And we weren't great at long-term planning or process. So when we came across the Traction book and the EOS framework, it was extremely helpful for us to put some systematic kind of checkpoints in place to evaluate our business and our growth trajectory. And it's been extremely helpful. And Mark Stanley has been great at helping helping us uh, kind of put that into our business. Now, I know one of the things you guys talk about is the, is the relationship between being efficient and being effective. And um, that's something I've got. I've been writing about that with far less expertise. I'm just a blogger. Um, on Morning Newsbeat, the notion that a lot of retailers will put effect- efficiency first, think less about effectiveness. And I always think that's a short-term play. It can only get you so far. You can't, you can't be, you can't, you you can't efficient your way into be into growth. I don't think. So respond to that. How do you how do you guys view the whole notion of efficiency versus effectiveness? Uh. I don't know that you can separate the two and be successful. You know, I think you have to have efficiency and effectiveness. And we joke around at Come and Go, use the ampersand a lot in our brand, and we always kind of say, and is harder, right? It's one thing to be effective and inefficient. It's one thing to be efficient and ineffective. Uh, but to be successful over time, you really have to be efficient and effective so that you can get on to what really matters. And how about you, Mark? Very nice, and thank you. Um, you know, they, they are related, efficiency and effectiveness. And I think about it like harnessing the human energy. And what we want to try to do is be efficient and conservative how we use that energy and direct it in the right way. And effective is using that energy really, really well to get a great outcome. So one thing that EOS does better than anything else is harness that human energy inside the organization at all levels, from leaders to middle managers to frontline folks, so that we're all kind of uh, walking the same path, walking step in step, arm in arm, as we execute this vision. That sounds um, abstract to me. Yep. Um, I, uh, so put some meat on that. Give me, a, give me an anecdote or two that, that it defines what that means. 
I'd be happy to. Oh, so, you know, one of the one of the kind of documents that comes out of this EOS framework is the L10 meeting agenda. And what it does is it puts more purpose and design into how you run your meetings. And so, you know, I can say that, you know, the common approach to meetings, and I've worked for companies, you know, before I joined Come and Go full time again, and you kind of just discuss a lot of things or you talk about things or it takes you 20 minutes to kind of get going once you're in the room together. And what this framework does is it allows time time to have those kind of personal touches with a little segue or headlines on what's going on across your business. But it also kind of forces you to make sure that what you're focusing on and the priorities of the business are highly visible. And then if something is off track, you kind of knock it down the agenda to get to that discussion and solve position. And so you, you set up two thirds of your time in the room together to really try to solve issues, to make sure that you're being efficient with your time. You know, it's a 90 minute meeting. It's a kind of a tight window for a senior team yet also to be effective that you're actually getting things done and solving. I've been an entrepreneur too, for too long, and 90-minute meeting sounds endless to me. Um, my, my dad uh, was a, an elementary school principal, and he firmly believed that you never do an after-school meeting. You only do meetings before school, because after-school meetings can go on forever. Before school meetings, they got to be over by 8.30 because the kids are there. Pe teachers have to get to the, to the classroom. Is that a... Does that... Would you view that kind of re attitude as being inhibiting or focusing? Oh, I think it's highly focusing. I think it gives you that kind of burning platform of, hey, we've got to solve for this. Let's cut the waste out of this meeting. And again, still save time for the human elements. You know, share what's going on in your personal life. Share what's going on across your teams. But the majority of the time in the room is focused on actually solving issues. I don't want to focus too much on meetings, but I'm fascinated by this. Mm -hmm. So I love the Jeff Bezos um, um, approach, which is he never puts together working groups that can't be fed with two pizzas. I know this. I love this. I'm so glad you said this. <laughs> right. You would say you agree with that. I completely agree. I think one of the issues is that, you know, corporations, especially of our size, we have about 250 associates in our store support center. And, you know, it's common for companies of our size to say, hey, communication's a bit of a problem for us here. And so we don't know what's going on enough in the other business. So when you form a project team, everybody wants to be on the project team. You end up with these Frankenstein teams of 14 or 16 people because no one wants to feel left out or like they weren't heard. And so the problem is not that we don't have enough time because we have too many meetings. We have too many people in our meetings. And then it's on those on the project team to actually report out to stakeholders across the business of what's going on so that people can opine in and maybe, hey, I'm going to sit on the next time that you discuss that topic because I have a view on it that may be helpful for your project. And, and let's go off the Jeff Bezos uh, uh, trend for a second. Another one of the things he's known for is when um, you have a new project, you have to write what the press release looks like for success. So Mark, as you engage with companies, you, the name of your business is Why, yeah. I assume to a great extent you're writing their press release for what success looks like when you have that introductory meeting when you say, I can help you. So what is the... What does that press release for success look like when you talk to a retailer about how you can affect their business? Yeah, you know, you know that's excellent. A lot of people talk about, hey, let's all get on the same page, but they don't really want to talk about what that page is or they don't really get there. In the EOS process, we have that page. It's called the Vision Traction Organizer, and it literally is front and back. On the vision side of it, you've got core values, core focus, tenure target, marketing strategy, and the three-year picture. And then on the back side, you bring it down to the ground with your one-year plan, your quarterly rocks, and your issues list. And so what that means is why that's efficient and effective back to that is because it puts it all down into one page that everybody can get on, whether you have 100 people, 1,000 people, or 10,000 people. And how, it? Oh, go ahead. I was just thinking, so following up on that for, for either one of you, um, mm -hmm. culture's a huge issue when you talk about businesses and, mm -hmm. and whether that means everybody needs to be heard or everybody needs to be respected. Every, everybody has different ways of looking at culture, but knowing that poisonous culture can ruin a business probably faster than anything. How, how does culture fit into all this? Because when you're talking about a process, there's always people that may not fit into a process. How do you get them on board? and have them become advocates. What's the old line? What? Culture eats strategy for breakfast? Yes. Isn't it? You know. yes. So if you don't have it right, you're not going to get anything done. Absolutely right. Uh, Terry, you want to take that one? Well, to me, it sounds like 
you know, when you're defining that culture, you want to make sure that all your people are on the same page. And Mark has this kind of literal page, this VTO document. You know, but to me, it's about your kind of what's your core target as an organization, whether that's your purpose or your big, hairy, audacious goal or however you kind of word it inside your, your firm. And then what are your core values and kind of forcing you know, each entrepreneur to put that on paper, those two things. Then there's a variety of tools in the EOS framework that you can use to kind of judge your talent against those things and kind of force you to have a harder look at who you're hiring and who you're promoting and who you're working with to say, you know, are we sure that these are really kind of cultural advocates for us? And so there are some nice tools in here that kind of help you have that objective look at your talent to say, okay, yep, culture fit or not culture fit. And then if they are a culture fit, you know, is that person in the right seat? Because there's times, you know, in our business where, uh, you know, we really like somebody, they embody our values, they're aligned with our mission, but they're just not in the right role for us. And so one of the great things about Traction is it's given us more of a retentive look to our associates to say, okay, maybe they're not right for that role, but they're right for come and go. So let's find a role where they can be successful and then move them internally versus just cutting the cord on that person. Do you hire for expertise or attitude? I would prefer to hire for attitude. Now, I think in our stores, you know, what you're looking at, a lot of what's done in our stores can be fairly easily taught, right? The hard thing to teach is someone that cares, someone that delivers customer service, someone that anticipates customers' needs, and can deliver excellent customer service recovery when things go wrong. And so we're looking for that in the hiring process, less so than seven years retail experience. Well, what do you do? What do you do? How do you... What do you do when you come face to face with reality? And right now, reality is unemployment is very low. Everybody's having trouble finding employees. So if you need five, six employees and only two of them are really good culture fits, what do you do? We always try to think long term, and that's easier said than done. You know, but if you are, you know, you have the fog the mirror approach to hiring because you know your. I'm sorry, say that one more time. What? The fog the mirror approach. (laughs) Fog the mirror. Okay. Yep. You fog this mirror, you got a job, right? And so if you've got that (laughs) approach to hiring, you know. That's I've never heard to- that one before. That's great. I love it. <laughs> uh, well, I should do this for a living. All right. So if you've got that approach to hiring, you know, then you're going to end up making poor decisions and you're going to be back here in 30 or 45 days all over again. And that wears you out. That's frustrating. That's more tiring than working another two weeks, whether that's doubles or triples or seven days consecutive or whatever it might be when you're in a tough situation. But if you can wait and be choosy and find someone that's going to deliver great service and be aligned to come and go's purpose, then they're more likely to stay. And therefore, you don't have to come back and do this again in a month or two. And so really trying to get our, our hiring manager to think longer term about about who you select for talent is the best thing that I can give uh, to our listeners from an advice perspective. Does that mean your turnover rate is lower than than the convenience store industry's uh, average? It is, and we're still making progress. Um, humble brag here, I got an email on the show floor just a couple minutes ago. Uh, we had another excellent month of uh, turnover improvements, uh, retention improvements. And so in the last four months, Come and Go has decreased its hourly turnover by seven percentage points over, this piece, over the period of four months. Wow. So we've had really, really incredible improvements in retention at the store level this summer. And do you, you ascribe that to smarter, not the smarter hiring, you're getting better people, they're not leaving. Correct. A number of things. So how, if it were easy, everybody would do it. So it's obviously complicated. And it's also complicated to possibly explain and get people enthusiastic on a monthly basis. Like if you, if you walked into the conference room and said, look, we have salty gummy bears. People would go, ooh, either great or terrific or terrible. But when you say we have a process and here's how we do things and it will benefit the company, how do you make that as exciting as the made up salty gummy bears? I think that's our job as leaders, to make it exciting, to make it fun, to approach what can be repetitive tasks with uh, an energy and a purpose that makes it beyond just you know, filling coffee or pumping gas. Is there a level of caring that goes into this where it, you're able to say, you know, this just shows how much we care about you because we're investing in this, we're, we're spending money, we're, um, uh, we're, we're, we're not just putting you in a position, we're putting you in a position to succeed? Absolutely. I mean, caring is one of our five core values. And, you know, we discovered these core values. They've been a part of Come and Go for all years. What are the other four, real quick? Passion, integrity, teamwork, and excellence. And, you know, you look at, you know, I look at the turnover work that we've done. You know, I'd say it's kind of three-pronged. One is culture. 
right? That's kind of where it starts and finishes for the most part. Uh, you know, giving our associates a purpose that's bigger than just making coffee uh, every day. And for us, that's making days better, right? Number two is analytics. You know, there are a lot of data out there on your associates, uh, how long they're staying, what makes them successful, and then how to screen for those that are more likely to be successful. And so we're leveraging uh, that science. That's been very helpful for us. And then lastly, money talks. Let's be honest here, right? And so in that regard, uh, we've made a number of investments and we're able to think long-term in these investments. We're able to you know, pay people more competitively. We're able to extend family leaves. We're able to do a number of things that make come and go to a more attractive place from an associate value proposition. And so I'd say kind of data, culture, and investments have been the keys to our success and retention. Let me ask you a question. Is Now, you're a private company. Yes, company. The things that you're describing strike me as being more easily done in a private company than a public company, because com public companies are, are beholden to shareholders as opposed to stakeholders. Now, I would argue that really smart public companies ought to be stakeholder driven and eventually the shareholders will be rewarded, but that's not necessarily a popular view uh, or a common view out there. Do you, do you have an advantage being a private company? Do you think these, if you were suddenly the, the CEO of a public company tomorrow, could you apply these same tenets? Well, so two parts there. First, there are very few remaining big public companies in this space. They've consolidated quite a bit. And so most of the industry is private companies. And so they're beholden to the same kind of stakeholders and shareholders that we are. So most of the listeners here should be able to make these types of investments as well. And you know, to if I was the CEO of a public company, you know, there's enough research out there by now that should speak to your point that if we think longer term about our investments, you know, that actually delivers a higher stock price performance over time. It's just hard to have the job, uh, sat, the job safety in the public sector uh, to be able to kind of see those investments come to fruition. Yeah, so, I, I, I I agree with you. Wouldn't it be pretty to think so? Because, to quote Hemingway, I mean, the thing is, is that all that's true, and yet, you know, the woods are filled with um, um, the bodies of CEOs who have made bad decisions because they needed to hit their numbers on the next quarter and were not thinking about, a f they were thinking about being efficient and, and making their shareholders happy, not making their, not understanding that stakeholders ought to be number one, and that means employees, means business partners, you know, the up and down the line. I mean, would you, would you agree with that? Absolutely. It's a virtuous cycle, right? So if you take care of the people, they take care of the customer. Customer brings more and more business, more profitable to shareholder, back to reinvestment for the people. So it's a virtuous cycle, right? And uh, you can kind of start anywhere, but if you st in my mind, if you start with the people first, you get the best, uh, the best turn on that cycle. So Tanner, thinking about how you've done this, and you've done this for a number of years, um, do you ever take your foot off the gas, so to speak, where you may say, okay, we're looking good, we're maybe not going to up our investment or up our commitment, we're going to kind of see how it will play out, and is there ever even a situation where, where you'll have employees just say, hey, what about, what about this process? Where you, you didn't talk about it today. Is it less important? So how, how do you keep that top of mind so it's moving in the direction you want it to move in? Well, I like to think we don't take our foot off the gas. Uh, we, what we do from a, from a total rewards philosophy is we have you know, our desired uh, percentile ranking in the marketplace to say, okay, here's where we want to be on comp. Here's where we want to be on PTO. Here's where we want to be on 401k. And there's really two big arm races right now in corporate America. One is on technological innovation and the other is on associate benefits, right? Those are the two big investment vehicles for major corporations today. We're no different. We're doing exciting things on the tech side. We're doing exciting things on the associate side. And so for us, you know, we say, okay, we want to be, you know, I won't put it out, you know, pick a number X percentile on PTO. Then we do a market review every year because there's a lot of other companies out there that are trying to enhance their benefits too. And we don't want to lag behind and lose our place in the marketplace. And so we say, okay, if our desire is to be 80th percentile on this benefit, then we do an annual review and we say, okay, you know what? We got to invest another couple of days in order to stay 80th percentile and make those investments. Now, you don't take your foot off the gas, but let me ask you a question. You started this process in 2002, as I understand it, right? We started working with Mark in 02. Um, we started working with Traction. Mark, when did we start Traction? 09. 09. 
Well, that partially answers my question, because my question was going to be, you started in pro- the process in 2002. What did you do in 2008 when the economy went south? Which is actually another way of asking when the economy goes south again. And it will, right? I mean, inevitably, mm-hmm. we will have a recession. It's, gonna, it just, it's a matter of how bad it will be, because that's what happens. Are you able to apply the, the, same, the same standards and the same tenets to your business in those times or is it harder, or maybe is it easier because you real it becomes your differential advantage? Well, you know, I think for us, we don't run our business cyclically. We run our business generationally, and so when you look at the investments that we make and the way that we treat our people, you know, we are financially sound enough to where a bad cycle, no matter if it was the Great Recession or something worse, isn't going to knock us off our foundation. And so it actually becomes an advantage, to your point, to when you know people start cutting back on those things and we maintain our levels in the marketplace and maintain consistency, that it actually increases our brand from an employment and a customer perspective, which helps us again in the long term. So here we are in, in late, mid to late 2018, unemployment's under 4%. Um, thinking about how do you tell your story around jobs. It's something everybody's looking at. And next, we, we recently did a consumer survey where we, at, we picked a bunch of attributes about jobs. Is it close to where I work or live? Is flexible hours? Do I have daycare? Do I, things that may or may not relate to convenience stores, but we listed about 25 attributes and they were able to rank them. The top four were all compensation related. They were benefits, they were money, they were things like that. Those are things that little harder to have a philosophical discussion on because you either pay them more, you don't pay them more, and, and that's that. The one that struck me that really has some interest for this is the fifth highest rated one, and it was a phrase, makes me happy. How could mm. all of this tie together into a job that you can say makes me happy? Yeah, be happy to answer that. Uh, so... In terms of you know, how it all ties together, we've got a lot of activity in our business in the stores. And it's, we do a number of things in the store level to try to delight our associates. And so you know, one of the things that we recently launched is we gave every associate the day off on their birthday. Right? And so some of these kind of delighting points that are not major investments, but just show that we care. Uh, we've uh, completely upgraded our recognition platforms inside our store so that the kind of rep- uh, the just uh, repetitive tasks that happen inside come and go stores are now being noticed and appreciated and saying, hey, you were really great helping me do the trash yesterday. I'm just going to write you a little card here. And then we have some recognition uh, gift cards across the stores every monthly that they can distribute to their staff. And so there's just some little things that you can do that aren't going to break the bank for no, no matter how big your company is or how, how small your company is that can really kind of show that you actually do care. You know, it's interesting. And I've been writing about this for a long time. It seems to me that most companies treat their empl- maybe most is the wrong word, but many companies treat their, com- their, their employees as if they're a cost. I mean, I've had this in my whole career, right? When, before I started working for myself, I was a writer working for magazines, newspapers, the whole thing. I was a cost. The sales guys, those were assets because they brought money in. Of course, they had nothing to sell against if I didn't write what I had to write. And it seems to me, and so I've learned through both personal experience and also talking to a lot of f- folks, that that is a key driver, right? If you can make, if you can create a culture in which people feel that they are a, an asset to the company and not a cost to the company, that is an enormous, um, enormous advantage. My friend Jim Donald, who used to be the CEO of Starbucks, now the CEO of Albertsons, likes to say, likes to say to folks that he, he, one of his core tenets is to always remember that nobody's more important than the people on the front lines, right? Mm-hmm. You walk into a convenient one of your stores or you walk into a supermarket, whatever happens to people, people, most people, I don't, maybe you're going to tell me this is not true, but I'll bet you if somebody goes into a come and go store, they have no idea who you are. But if I'm working the register, they know who I am. So I better feel, I better create, I better personify the cultural thing that you're trying to do or otherwise it doesn't matter what you're doing at headquarters. You're absolutely right. So I'll give an example of, you know, what we've tried to do culturally to, to change that change the culture really and so 
our market visits where, you know, members at the store support center, members of our leadership teams, you know, go out into the field and visit stores and see stores. And, you know, for too long, we had, you know, it was almost like a, a big test and it was kind of a got you kind of mentality, right? To where, you know, we'd walk in and we would point out the four things out of a thousand that you got wrong, right? Oh, there's a little bit of dust over here, right? Or the top of your pumps are a little bit dirty or underneath this, there's a, you know, whatever the examples are, right? And so we've tried to say, you know what, this is on us as leaders to set the example and the way for which we try to give feedback to our associates. Because if that's how we lead, then our GMs, our store managers, they're going to be in their store and somebody could work a really good shift. But if you know they didn't tidy up the back room before they left and they only heard kind of two things from their leader that day and it was, hey, back room was a little messy. Can you get that better next time? And you miss the 998 things that person did over the course of the eight hours that were positive, then that trickles down to the organization. And so now we try to make it more about culture in the store. We try to ask about their team. How are you doing? Ask them questions about their personal life. Hey, how's it going with your family? You know, tell me more about what you do outside the store. And say, hey, I really like what you did here. And you know, if there is an issue in the store, you know, I don't try to come down on them too hard. I always ask them this one question. I go, what's your process for this? Right? If your bathroom's a little bit messy, I'll say, hey, what's your process for cleaning your restrooms? And then I'll try to evaluate if the process is strong enough to be successful. And if the process isn't strong enough, then it's not going to be a clean restroom. So I'll say, oh, you're only doing that once a, once a day? You know, the deep clean or whatever it might be? You know, let's maybe step that up to the standard. We're trying to get that to X times per day. And then you know, we'll come back in a couple months and we'll see if your restrooms have improved. And so just trying to approach things differently. Focus more on the good than the negative. That's a great way to set things up because if you say, I went into the bathroom and there were paper towels on the floor, you've just inst- you've instilled a negative in them. You are not happy with their performance. But if you ask about process, you're essentially coaching them. You're essentially giving them some skills and you're, you're, you're giving them some lessons they can learn. And, and I, I love the, um, the, the, the line that's used in setting up the session that you guys were in today. And it was basically... Do you have a grip on your business or does your business have a grip on you? And that's what we're talking about in process here. So before we leave, Mark, um, give us your website so anybody interested in learning more can check it out. Uh, Yes, thank you. Uh, You know, one of the things that Jim Collins said for a second is magic occurs when you take the entrepreneurial spirit and you couple it with the discipline execution of process. And so I like that and that stays with me. So you got to take the entrepreneurial spirit with process. For me, the website is www.ycompany, that's W-H-Y company spelled out, C-O-M-P-A-N-Y dot com. Well, check it out. I think it's very yep, interesting. I think the whole process is. We know how to find Come and Go, uh, the 400 stores in the Midwest. And Kevin, where morning, can we find you? Morningnewsbeat.com. News, commentary every day, wine and movie recommendations on Fridays. Thank you all three for joining us today. And thank you for listening to Convenience Matters. Convenience Matters is brought to you by Nax and produced in partnership with Human Factor. For more information, visit convenience.org.